Happy Sabbath and welcome to day 79 out of our 100 days of prayer. And our text this morning is found in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 14. And it reads, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Let's bow our heads as we begin. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day in which you have instituted from the very beginning for us to rest in you and to enjoy our communion with you. Lord, in the next few moments, we ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit to guide us in our thoughts and as we study your word. We love you and we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to turn our attention to the story that we are familiar with, found in the uh, book of Mark, chapter 2. Mark, chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. I'm going to read it first, starting in verse 1. It says, And when he, Jesus, that is, returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together, so that there was not even room, no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, above Jesus. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. So Jesus is back in town preaching. And there are four guys that, that want to hear him preach, right? And they've got this friend, though, that was paralyzed, sick. And so these four guys went to his house pick him up literally and take him to the house where Jesus was preaching. I want us to pause here for just a moment and sort of use our sanctified imagination of this scene. These guys are picking up this fully grown man on his mat and went walking, stumbling through the rocky roads of Capernaum to get to this house. So then when they get to the house, which by the way, it's the same house where Jesus was when he healed Simon's mother-in-law in in Mark chapter 9, verse 29. But when Jesus was there, he was healing a lot of people in town and casting out demons. And we're told in the Desire of Ages, it's in fact Peter's house. So just imagine the, the anticipation that comes with knowing that Jesus is coming back in town again. And so he was preaching. So tons of people would be swarming to this house. So when they get to the house, sure enough, people have come from all over Galilee to hear Jesus preach. In fact, some of them have come as far as from Judea and Jerusalem. We're told in Desire of Ages that the kinds of people that were present there, disciples obviously were there, but they were also the Pharisees, the doctors of the law, the crowd, the sick, the eager, the curious, and even the unbelieving. Sister White even notes that there are different nationalities and all grades of society that were present. And so it's completely packed, standing room only, if you can imagine this. People are even standing outside and they can't get in. Now, imagine yourself if you're one of those four guys bringing the paralytic man. If I had been one of those four guys, I would have just said, you know what? At some point, right, this dude's got to stop preaching. And we'll just have to hang out right there or wherever that is by the backstage door somewhere in order to get our friend here in an encounter with Jesus. But no, no, that wasn't good enough for these guys. And I don't know exactly how the conversation went down, but maybe one of them said, well, we got to, we got to try in the door again. Well, that doesn't work. Or maybe we got to try the the, the window or try a different route. Well, what route do you choose? Well, I don't know. Maybe one of them had the best idea to go to the roof. Obviously, right? So these four guys, again, imagine this. Carry this paralytic man on his mat up to the roof. 
and then you get to the roof, what then? Well, you dig a hole, of course, right? Sounds like a brilliant idea. I want you to understand that in the first century Galilee, the houses were constructed in such a way that the roof would have to be like some kind of a combination of beams, tree branches, tree limbs, and kind of they're put on like a, in a crisscross mesh pattern. And then there would have been this thick, very hard clay to gel them together to make them stick. And so when it says they're making a hole, they're digging through this roof and they're just not making a hole that's, that's annoying on a rainy day, if, if some of us can, uh, can relate to that, but they're making a hole that is big enough to lower a fully grown man through. Just process this for a moment. They're, they're, they're excavating this person's roof. Maybe we can ask a few questions because it's helpful at times, right? Sometimes we might miss some things. So Jesus is down in the house and he's preaching. And as he preaches, things begin to drop on his head and he begins to wonder why. And there's branches and clay dropping on his head. And it, I'm really, really curious as to what Jesus is thinking at this point. And what is everyone else thinking at this point, right? What is Peter thinking? And so then they figure out a way to lower him through the hole. Again, I'm not sure exactly how they did this. I don't know if they kind of took off their robes and started making some kind of a pulley system to lower him and the bed at the foot of Jesus. And the next scene is even more remarkable. And I want us to imagine this scene perhaps in a slow motion. All eyes are locked on Jesus, right? As he's preaching and he's slowly witnessing what is taking place here. And maybe a few side glances to Peter, the owner of the, the, owner of the house. And Jesus is looking at the man sitting down after being lowered. And the man is sitting there looking at Jesus' eyes. And Jesus glances up at the four friends who are still on the roof, peering down through the hole, wondering what's going to happen next. And the Bible says in verse 5 that seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now hold on for a minute. Well, that's not exactly what they had come for, right? But that's good. And the Pharisees start to grumble, obviously, because they, they believed of course, that God is the only one with the authority to forgive sin. So they wondered in their hearts, well, who does this Jesus think he is granting forgiveness of sins? <laughs> but the interesting part is Jesus knows exactly what they're thinking in their hearts. And so he says, you know, well, watch this. <laughs> I mean, not really. He didn't say that. But that's what I like to believe that how my version would go. Let's check this out. In verse 9, Jesus says this question, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say the rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I want you to notice for a moment an interesting um, paragraph that is found in the Desire of Ages, page 270, but also that is in our reading this morning in Ministry of Healing, page 77. Sister White says there that the paralytic found in Christ healing for both the soul and the body. The spiritual healing was followed by physical restoration. This lesson should not be overlooked, she says. There are today thousands suffering from physical disease who, like the paralytic, are longing for the message, thy sins are forgiven. The burden of sin with its unrest and unsatisfied desires is the foundation of their maladies. They can find no relief until they come to the healer of the soul. The peace which he alone can give 
would impart vigor to the mind and health to the body. The paralytic man wasn't just looking for physical healing. He was looking for spiritual healing. So that's the first point I want to point out for us to observe. The paralytic, paralytic man wasn't just looking for physical healing, but he was also looking for spiritual healing. Now, this is not to devalue whatever physically that may be going on with our bodies when we're sick, when we are struggling uh, with something with our physical bodies. I don't think that's what she's saying here. Don't misunderstand. But rather, I think, in fact, it is an encouragement that there is a greater strengthening. There is a greater healing in Christ. One that physical restoration can in fact follow after spiritual healing. And so the, the story continues. Jesus tells the man, pick up your mat and go home. And that man stood up miraculously. He picked up his mat and walked out the door. And at the end of this short little passage, the Bible says in verse 12, all the people said, whoa, we've seen remar remarkable things here today. You know what? And I submit to you, there's something so beautiful here as well for us to highlight. And that that man walked out of that house that day with new faith because of the faith of not only his faith in Jesus, but some the fate of his friends as well. That man walked out of the house with new legs because of the faith also of his tenacious friends. Friends who were so determined to get their friend to Jesus that they're willing to destroy even someone else's roof to make it happen. So this first observation that I want us to notice is that the paralytic man wasn't just looking for physical healing. He was in fact looking for spiritual healing. And the second thing I want us to notice is that the friends, in fact, indeed carried the mat. And maybe as, as simple as that observation, but you see this paralyzed man had lived his life on a mat. This mat was symbolized as his safety, his, his security and his home his identity. It was also a symbol of his weakness. It's a symbol of everything that was wrong with him. It's a symbol of those things that made it hard to be in a relationship with him. It's that thing that he could have used to keep people at an arm's distance and say, no, 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 don't, don't get too close to this. It's the thing that he could have been uh, ashamed of for people to see. It's a thing that he could have been adamant that they not touch and fearful if someone were to get really close to him. And on the other side of the equation, the mat could have been the thing that the four friends said, you know what, that's, that's a hindrance to our relationship. You don't want to get too close there because it, then it gets sticky, it gets harder. Everything's going to take a little bit longer and it's just, you know what, it gets difficult and it's just awkward, there's too much work. And there's a burden to bear if you step into that relationship. And not just a burden, perhaps at this time in history, there was a specific stigma attached to his condition. In Desire of Ages, page 267, we're, to we're also told that the Pharisees regarded affliction as an evidence of divine displeasure. And they held themselves aloof from the sick and the needy. Yet often these are the very ones who exalted themselves as holy were more guilty than the sufferers they condemned. You see, it's clear. It wasn't just a physical burden. It was a spiritual problem to be in a relationship with this paralytic. And yet that point of pain was not the hindrance to the relationship between the other man. The man on the mat didn't say, no, 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 please don't come, up, come close to this. And the four friends didn't say, you know what? That's just, that's not going to work, man. It's, it, that's too much work. Too, it's too hard for us. 
And that point of pain, instead of becoming a barrier to their relationship, it became the point of connection that then created the possibility for a miracle, for God to perform a miracle. And church family, the truth is that we all have a mat. We all have one. It's that thing that we're nervous about for people to find out. It's that thing that we don't want anyone to see. Maybe it's something in our past, our insecurity, or it's a, a fear. It's the thing that we try to hide or we try to avoid or we try to put a, a mask over it to cover it up. It's the thing that we're afraid of. If we let that out, no one will ever want to be in relationship with us because it's just too difficult. It's that confession, perhaps, that we need to make. It's the help that we need to ask for. It's an insecurity that we need to admit. Or perhaps it's the sin that we've committed or perhaps the sin that's been committed against us. The pain, the habit, the thing in our past, the thing in our personality, something about our family, our finances, or perhaps our circumstances that we try, we try at all cost to just hide because we are just afraid if somebody sees that, they're not going to want to ever get close to us. But the thing is, we can use that mat to keep people at an arm's length. Or we could say that this is the point where I want to invite someone in. Because this point of pain and this place of connection with this mat could become an incubator for healing and transformation. Church family, who's carrying your mat today? Because your miracle might just be on the other side of your vulnerability. And on the other hand, I have to ask this question, whose mat are you willing to carry? Because somebody else's miracle may be just on the other side of you being willing to embrace the awkward, the messy, the, and the inconvenient. Whose mat are you carrying? And who is carrying your mat? The, sec the last thing, not the second thing, the third thing that I want us to notice in this story is that when we carry the mat, we have the capacity to change someone else's life. Just like the four guys, we can change the trajectory of someone else's life. We can, in fact, activate new stories and we can activate new life. We can become partakers of God's divine nature as we, uh, were have, we have been designed to. And in such a way that we become co-laborers with Him through His Spirit working in people's lives. Healing can take place when we become partakers of God's divine nature. You see, that man on that, that day walked away from that scene completely changed. He walked away with a completely new life, new legs, a new outlook, and a new way of living. Yes, because of his faith, in Jesus. One that's embodied in our text this morning that says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. And save me, and I shall be saved. For you are my praise. But it's also because of the faith of his friends. You know, so often we ask God to heal our physical illnesses but we're not willing to acknowledge and recognize that we have a deeper need of Him, of a spiritual healing from our sins. And so this, this morning or this evening, whatever time zone you're in, perhaps I want to challenge us. Why not ask God today to show us of our, our own need of spiritual healing? And maybe perhaps... When we acknowledge that there is, in fact, physical healing that can come forth as well. And so we're going to move in in a time of prayer. And there's some praise reports that I want to mention and prayer requests as well.
before we close. Some of those prayers reports are um, one that is God has provided ways for some of our Adventist hospitals to receive much needed personal protective equipment or PPE in order to treat COVID-19 patients. And the second praise is that AWR online meetings uh, have attracted hundreds of thousands of views through Facebook and through other mediums. And God is really reaching multitudes of people through the internet in the time of crisis. And we really want to just praise God for it and continue to pray for um, many more lives being affected or being influenced. And a, there are some prayer requests as well that I want to mention. Uh, there are three names that I, I was uh, not, um, notified with that are needing prayer right now. And those names are David Titioka, uh, Aridan Rumambi, and Nona Salaki. And we want to uh, continue to lift them up in prayer. And we want to also mention that there, we obviously need a spiritual healing from sin, selfishness, and pride. And we want to pray for this anonymous woman who has been under a... Uh, demonic attacks for 15 years and we only also want to pray for the ministry of new adventist addictions recovery center in orlando florida which is helping to fight the opi opioid epidemic and we want to pray as well for millions longing for freedom from addiction and finally we want to pray for the final night of the awr online evangelistic meetings and for many more to be influenced and to be brought closer, and perhaps for many that have not made the decision to give their lives away in a complete surrender to Jesus, um, we want to pray for those decisions as well. So let's spend some time. I'm going to give us a minute to silently pray for ourselves, and I will close up with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful the ways that you have led us in the past that still give us peace and assurance that you are in still indeed in control even today. Even in the midst of um, unrest and chaos that we know you're still uh, reigning over us, Lord. We pray that um, we may continue to be faithful to you. And Lord, we praise you for um, and there's so many responses that we have taken place in regards to the hospitals uh, having received um, enough PPEs to treat COVID-19 patients. And uh, we know we've struggled with that in the past, but you have um, come through uh, nonetheless. I pray that um, as we continue on with our process, I pray that you may continue to guide each uh, person and in their processes and their and recovery as well. Lord, we thank you as well in the ways you have led through the AWR online meetings and how you have blessed their reaching hundreds of thousands of people. And I pray, Lord, that those lives that are affected, may uh, you draw closer to them and there be decisions, Lord, that they can make uh, for you, uh, for a full surrender to you. I pray that you um, may work in their hearts for those decisions. Lord, we want to pray as well for uh, the prayer requests that have been mentioned. Uh, and I pray that um, for David as well and um, Aridan and Nona in their um, needs, uh, though they, they're not mentioned, but you know what is in their hearts as well. Uh, Lord, I want to pray for spiritual healing, especially from ours. Uh, in, in in our in our lives from sin and selfishness and pride and help us Lord to to be attentive to the leading of your spirit to to be a miracle to someone else's life as well I pray for the countless countless requests that we have mentioned um, 
that have been mentioned previously. And Lord, we thank you so much again for the opportunity to pray for one another. And we ask that we, uh, that your will be done in our lives. And uh, we just surrender our lives once more to you, Lord. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.